بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم و رحمت الله و برکاته It's the season of Hajj A lot of us have already t- gone on to the trip Some of us are getting ready to go Friends, families, loved ones Who are taking part in this annual event Which is an obligatory act upon them Within the religion of Islam Now Hajj is a Is rather the spirit and essence of Islam It's one of the obligatory acts upon mankind as prescribed by God in the chapter of Ali Imran from the Holy Quran which states and pilgrimage to the house is incumbent upon men for the sake of Allah upon everyone who is able to undertake the journey to it and whoever disbelieves then surely Allah is self-sufficient above any need of the world Ali Imran verse 97 now like other religions which also have pilgrimages Hajj is one of the main pillars of the obligatory acts of worship within Islam. We are joined once again for Live in London with Dr. Sayyid Amman Akshwani. With Dr. Sayyid Amman Akshwani, it's great to have you with us again tonight. Thank you. Sayyid, now one of the questions that often arise around the issue of Hajj or issues of general acts of worship, as mentioned in the verse of the Holy Quran, which I just read out, it says Allah is self-sufficient. So why has he made Hajj or even other acts of worship obligatory upon us. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be discussing Hajj and there's a part of me that wishes that I was now uh, in the Holy Land of Medina where many of our friends are and then from there going towards the Holy Land of Mecca. It's an interesting question. I think many people ask this question in relation to many of the acts of worship. Uh, sadly, the acts of worship in the religion of Islam be they praying or fasting or going on the pilgrimage to Mecca, are normally described in terms of the consequences of what happens if you do not perform them, rather than the wonderful spirituality that is the essence of them. I think many of us when we were younger, when we're told about prayers, the focus is on the fact that if we don't pray, we go to hell. Or if you don't fast, you'll go to hell. Or if you don't go towards the pilgrimage, you'll go to hell. The reality is that this is far from the truth of the philosophy of the acts of worship in the religion of Islam. You see that there is a constant yearning in any human being for growth, for evolution, for perfection. We recognize that at our most primitive, we could be similar to an animal. An animal eats, we eat. An animal drinks, we drink. An animal sleeps, we sleep. An animal has desires, we have desires. However, what we seek and yearn that is different from the animalistic is this growth, this yearning for perfection, this yearning to actualize our potential, having recognized in Islamic thought that the divine breath is part of our very makeup. When God mentions in the Quran that he breathes his spirit into us, there is a divinity of the most limited understanding and definition in the human being. That human being therefore has immense potential in terms of what they can achieve. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib says, دَوَاءُكَ مِنْكَ وَمَا تَبْصُرْ وَدَاءُكَ فِيكَ وَمَا تَشْعُرْ أَنْتَ الْكِتَابِ الْمُبِينَ الَّذِي بِأَحْرُفِهِ يُظْهَرُ الْمُضْمَرْ what does he say? He says, the cure is within you, but you do not see. The disease is within you, but you do not sense. You are the clear open book who with your letters, the unseen can be seen. Do you think that you are something small when the whole universe exists within you? Therefore, the human being having recognized that at one stage they were at a very low stage, in the womb of their mother, then they come into this world, then adolescence, there's a constant growth. And that this growth is never ending. Part of the support mechanism and the training program for this growth to continue, to take us away from the mundane vegetative or the mundane animalistic and go to that wonderful representative of God on earth as Adam is known when the human creation is introduced to the angels part of the training 
program and the mechanisms given to us are the acts of worship. The acts of worship are cultivating our growth. But fundamentally, the act of worship is not the ends. They are a means for us to grow as human beings. My prayers are not the ends for me. My prayers are God's guidance to me in terms of a set of exercises that humble me. A set of exercises that instill ethics into me. A set of exercises that discipline me. A set of exercises that recognize that the human being in their greatest form is a creation who is ready to serve other creations, who is ready in turn to serve the Creator. Therefore, when you're looking at these acts of worship, God doesn't need mine and your act of worship. They are for my growth as a human being. They're for my benefit. You see, if I pray, for example, the evening prayers, it doesn't make a difference to God whether I pray or I don't. It makes a difference to me. Because I, as a human being, going down in prostration that night, it's humbling me. It's reminding me that one day I'm going to return back to where exactly I'm prostrating. I'm prostrating on earth. I'm prostrating on clay. Imam Ali Nabi Talib gives a wonderful philosophy about hajj or fasting or prayer and really divides the human being and the human creation into the following. He says, God, I don't worship you out of fear of hell. That's the worship of a slave. Nor do I worship you because I want heaven. That's the worship of a businessman. I worship you because I found you worthy of being worshipped. That is what? That's the worship of a free human being. There are some of us who worship God out of fear of hell. I'm going to go to Hajj because if I don't go to Hajj, I'm going to burn in hell. That's the worship of a slave. There are some of us who will go to Hajj because, you know what, if I go to Hajj, there's a good chance I'm going to be guaranteed heaven and the rivers that flow and the milk and whatever else there is in heaven. But then there's a third group. That third group recognizes what greater opportunity is there in my life and which invite is more wonderful to anyone's house like the invite to the house of God. Sometimes you are invited to a wedding you're invited to a gathering. You can't wait to be there. You're actually honored that you're invited. You're like, oh, they actually consider me as that close a friend or they consider me as, you know, that important a person. Here at this moment, when you're going to Hajj, instead of thinking of Hajj as this thing of, if I don't do it, I'm going to burn in hell. Or if I do it, I'll go to heaven. Put these two aside. That's when you look at the beauty of worship in Islam. That a human being is doing things not as a reward system or out of fear, but because they've understood the philosophy of this experience, be it prayer, be it fasting, or be it hajj. I guess, as, as you mentioned, the philosophy of the acts of worship, a lot of the youth who haven't grasped that control of their religion yet, some might miss their, for example, morning prayers, a lot of the ones that I've been speaking to in my friend circles, for example, come and say, when I say to them, why don't you get married? I'll get married when I become more religious. Or why don't you go hajj? I'll go hajj when I become more religious. What could be said to people like that? Because like you said, if you build up on those acts of worship, you'll better yourself and it's for your own benefit. What well, I don't blame them because I think that the way hajj was presented to many of them was not with a spiritual base. Rather, it was presented as, oh, this is another obligatory act that you have to perform. The furu'id deen or the roots of the religion are ten. Salah, Psalm, Hajj, Zakat, Khums, Amr bin Ma'roof, Nahi al-Munkar, Tawalla, Tabarra, and Jihad. And these are obligatory on you. No one was coming forward and providing them with the wonderful explanations of Hajj, which the Ahl al-Bayt provide. I remember Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib before he passed away, in his final will, there's a wonderful line. Do not abandon the house of God. For if you abandon the house of God, then you've abandoned your dignity. Here the Imam is not telling people, don't abandon the house of God, otherwise you're going to burn in hell. I think for many years, people, when it came to their understanding of the philosophy of Hajj, 
for many, that philosophy of Hajj was always focused on the fear aspect or always focused on a very legal look at the pilgrimage in Islam. They hear people coming back from Hajj, you know what, I got this wrong or they're haram or for example, I didn't wear this properly. It, there wasn't much of a spiritual emphasis. Whereas when you look at, for example, Imam Zain al-Abideen in his famous uh, discussion with Shibli, it's a phenomenal discussion on Hajj. The way he looks at Hajj, he's telling him that, you know what, this journey that you're going on is one of the most wonderful spiritual journeys you'll ever go on or you'll ever undertake. And I think there needs to be more of an emphasis to our youth on this front, the spiritual aspect, but also on another front, which is what? When someone says, I don't want to go to Hajj because if I go to Hajj, therefore I'm going to have to become religious. I prefer to go to Hajj when I'm 40 or when I'm 50, then I'll go to Hajj. Who gave you a license saying you're going to live till 40 and 50? If you have that person who's giving you that license, I beg you give me their phone number <laughs> because I'd be delighted to have their license as well. I'd be delighted to have their permission as well. Nobody knows when they're going to die. For them to arrogantly assume that, you know what, I can afford Hajj, but I'm not ready yet. So that's, a f that's a famous line many Muslims have when it comes to an obligatory act of worship. You find the Quran on many occasions says that people follow religions according to their whims and desires. What suits them of the religion, they take, and what doesn't suit them, they postpone. With Hajj, you have many people who always say lines like, when, you know, I'm not ready yet to go on Hajj. When you ask the person, what do you mean you're not ready? You know what? When I come back from Hajj, I'm going to have to wear hijab. That's not an excuse. On the contrary, the moment you realize that you have to wear hijab in the religion of Islam, that is when you have to wear undertake hijab. that act. There are others who will say, you know what? If I go to Hajj, what if I come back and I'm not as religious? You take one step towards God. God opens 10 doors for you. But fundamentally, however many excuses you're going to make, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it clear in the Quran, as you mentioned in chapter 3 verse 97. وَلِلَّهِ عَلَى النَّاسِ حِجُّ الْبَيْتِ مَنْ اسْتَطَاعَ عَلَيْهِ سَبِيلًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it clear in the Quran that one of the rights of God upon us is hajj. You can give as many excuses in the book. Now, yes, someone will say hajj is one of these obligatory acts that has conditions. You know, in, in Islamic law, we have Acts of worship which are absolute and acts of worship that have conditions. For example, Salat al-Jum'ah is an act of worship that is obligatory, but there's a condition to it in the presence of an infallible and so on. Salat al-Eid is an absolutely, is an act of worship that's obligatory, but with condition that the presence of the infallible and so on. Likewise with Hajj, Hajj is an act of worship that yes, there's no doubt. The ayah says, وَلِلَّهِ عَلَى النَّاسِ حِجُّ الْبَيْتِ مَنْ اسْتَطَاعَ God has a right over us that we perform Hajj on the idea that we have the capability to undertake that journey. Now, someone says al istitaa over here in this uh, famous verse in chapter 3 verse 97, istitaa, that capability to undertake the journey. What does God mean by that? You see, this word highlights that this act of ibadah is conditional. God has made it clear in the ayah. Man ilayhi sabila. Those who have the capability to go. Naturally, mental capability. Physical capability. Passage capability. You can't go on a journey towards Hajj if you know, for example, it's fraught with danger along the way. And financial capability. Financial, what does it mean? Financial if you look at the legal texts, amongst the number of conditions and explanations they have of financial is that you are able to afford that journey to Hajj. Of course, that you don't have certain obligatory payments which are due upon you before you go to Hajj. These must, of course, be cleared. And that upon your journeying to Hajj, you're not going to leave your family in a quagmire or in a very difficult situation. You don't want to say, for example, I know that hajj prices these days are, you know, getting more and more expensive. Um, you don't want to spend 8,000, 9,000, 10,000 pounds, for example, going to hajj and then coming back and your family has just about got a few hundred pounds at home. You have to have that istita'ah. And above all else, 
If you put mental capabilities, passage capabilities, physical capabilities, financial capabilities, that intention is fundamental. That I'm going on this journey, not because six of my friends are on that journey, not because all my friends are called Hajj and I'm the only one not called <laughs> Hajj, but rather I'm going on this journey because I sincerely want to have a fresh start with my Lord. I sincerely want to develop. I sincerely want to go in the footsteps of Nabi Ibrahim alayhi salam, the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him and his family. So you mentioned passage capability. A lot of the elders say we don't want to go Hajj or it's not right to go to Hajj because it's under a Wahhabi rule, it's not safe, things like this. What would your response be to them? Well, I, I would reply by saying that no doubt the, the ruling establishment of Saudi Arabia uh, is an establishment that has its clear grievances with uh, the Shia school. There's, you know, there's no doubt about that. And there's been sad events that have occurred in the last 30 odd years in that Hajj period. There's no doubt about that. There's been loss of life. There's been people you know, involved in stampedes and so on. At the same time, if none of us are going to go to Hajj, then who's going to honor the house of God, the place where Nabi Ibrahim alayhi salam provided us with a base, understanding of the meaning of discipline and the meaning of sacrifice with his son Ismail and his wife Hajar. Who's going to honor the house of God which saw its doors open for Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib to born, be born in? Who's going to honor the Prophet peace be upon his family, Fatima Zahra and the Imams of Baqi? I know there are people out there today who are saying, I don't want to go there because when you go there, you see a real sectarian identity as well as a sectarian ideology, which is a disgusting combination. But I think these can also fall into excuses as well. We have to be careful. That shaitan may whisper to some of us that, listen, you have to go on hajj, but you know what? The people who are there who are ruling, they're not good with the followers of Ahlul Bayt, so don't go. Go somewhere else. No. Hajj, the moment the istita'ah, that capability, mental, physical, passage, financial is there, that person has to undertake that journey. Now, some will argue, well, if some of our scholars may have made a certain statement or two, that's between you and the scholar that you may follow in terms of his political directives. And what he believes is the maslaha, the, what is for the benefits of the ummah um, at that particular moment. But for those who come and say that, no, I'm not going to go because there's a clash there. I think if people go there, don't necessarily have to make every slogan every day while you're there. Or you don't always have to make it a point that this is who we are. I think there's been good times and bad times. When I've gone to Hajj, I've seen years of a wonderful du'a kumail by Jannatul Baqi. And I've also seen years of unbelievable sectarian hate shown towards the followers of Ahlul Bayt And we can only pray that the Muslims come together and this sectarianism is removed. Inshallah. Going back to Prophet Ibrahim salam, as you mentioned, why was he ordered to build a, a house for God, build the Kaaba? Was there... What's the significance of the house being there? Because throughout narrations, there's things about Prophet Adam building a house of God as well. So it's a bit confusing to well, see different things. In the same way that there is the mystical house of the Lord in the heavens, likewise, this is its reflection on the earth. In the same way, the angels are constantly glorifying the Lord in the heavens. The mystical aspect of the religion of Islam states that it's the duty of the human being to constantly glorify their Lord. For them to glorify, they can do it, for example, in their local mosque. There are buyut, houses, where Allah has sanctioned for His name to be remembered and for His name to be exalted as per the verses in the Holy Quran. But this central house is the established one for all the Muslims to unite and congregate together on. I can't deny that a person 
for example, can go to their local mosque, can go to many wonderful mosques. But like you mentioned, this is the mosque and this is the grounds where Nabi Ibrahim السلام, was ordered to establish God's house. Before him, Nabi Adam السلام, had laid the foundation for the house. And then we see in the story mentioned in the Holy Quran in chapters like Surah Al-Baqarah and then further discussions of the journey towards Hajj and Surah Al-Hajj, a whole chapter of the Holy Quran is called Hajj. Chapter 22 of the Holy Quran is called Hajj. And if in the verses from 25, 26 onwards, you see a discussion on Hajj. Nabi Ibrahim is with his son Ismail. They've already had this fascinating relationship with that land, that valley. A weeping valley, a valley of tears, known as Bakka. I wonder what the similarity is between the valley of Bakka mentioned in the Psalms, which in other translations in the Bible is mentioned as the weeping valley, and why Allah calls that particular area Bakka. Because you know that sometimes you read that that land is known as the land of Mecca. And then you read that Allah mentions it as Bakka. I remember Muawiyah son of Ammar, Muawiyah bin Ammar in a discussion with Imam al-Sadiq is asking him a question about a woman who walks past him while he's in prayer. And then the Imam, having discussed that there's no issue there, mentions that this land of Bakka is known as Bakka from the idea that the men and the women are weeping in this land. And it's interesting that the Bible talks of the weeping valley, Bakka, and how the Quran mentions Bakka from the word Bukka. So you have Nabi Ibrahim alayhi salam has this relationship, first and foremost, the water of Zamzam, the spring water which emerges for his wife, Hajar or Hagar, when her son is thirsty. They settle in that land and then Allah SWT orders him, now raise and establish this house and people will come from far and wide. They'll come on their camels, they'll come from all the lean animals, they'll come here and they'll glorify the Lord. And he of course asks that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala looks after his followers and looks after his progeny and purifies this house. So you found that Nabi Adam alayhi salam is the one who laid the foundation. Nabi Ibrahim alayhi salam is the one who then builds the Kaaba. That's why you find today when you go there the remnants of that building is still there with Maqam Ibrahim. And I know Maqam Ibrahim if you look at the discussions many times Maqam Ibrahim is mentioned you know, some mention the whole of the Haram area, others mention, for example, some of the acts and Hajj as being Maqam Ibrahim. But generally it's considered that Maqam Ibrahim uh, is the, the remnants of that uh, footstep of Nabi Ibrahim alayhi salam while building the Kaaba with whom? With Nabi Ismail alayhi salam. So Adam alayhi salam, Ibrahim alayhi salam, they're the ones who establish that Kaaba. But in establishing the Kaaba is one thing, but then the whole relationship of Ibrahim, Hajar and Ismail is brought together when re remembering and honoring the Hajj. Honoring the Hajj. So obviously, Nabi Ibrahim salam built the Kaaba and a few hundred years later, I'm guessing, when our Prophet came or before our Prophet came, the Arabs would have had access to it after Prophet Ibrahim. Mm. What did they use that place for if they were still polytheists and the religion of Islam hadn't reached them? Were there still, not Muslims obviously, but people who believed in the oneness of God worshipping there? Or well, the Kaaba overtaken? had uh, custodians. Um, of the custodians would, for example, be um, Abd al-Muttalib, the grandfather of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him and his family. And you also had Khadija's father, Khuwailid. Um, these people were protectors of the Kaaba. Abdul Muttalib was a custodian of the Kaaba. And Abdul Muttalib alayhi salam, the, you know, the Arabs used to revere the Kaaba, but sadly had now been polluted by polytheism. 
And I think that you've got some of these Arab aristocrats who are living at the time who are now exploiting the fact that many people still come and travel from far and wide to honor Ibrahim. So don't imagine that the, the Arabs of, of the Quraysh, don't imagine that these people were, um, were not honoring Ibrahim or were not believing in God. The Arabs believed in God, but used to make these idols saying that they get us closer to God, which still counts as polytheism. If you believe in one God, but you show that God in the form of idols, that's still polytheism. So what happens is that these Arabs would still want to come. They'd want to come and honor a, uh, Nabi Ibrahim alayhi salam. But now the whole ceremony of honoring what Ibrahim did and what was the Hajj ceremony had now been distorted, had now been tainted. And if you look within the Holy Quran, you've got possible indicators where when you read the world of Hadith, they provide you with more of an understanding. You've got possible indicators in the Holy Quran where these people, the sacrifice would happen, but they throw, you know, they, they throw the blood onto uh, the Kaaba. You'd find that they'd be gossiping uh, around the Kaaba, merrymaking, speaking things which take them far away from God. So sadly, there was only a few who were really honoring the rights of Ibrahim alayhi salam, the way they should have been honored. You know, uh, Khadija's family were never those who were touched by idol worship in terms of they were known as Hanifs. Abdul Muttalib, Abu Talib, these were people who were always monotheists, never polytheists, never took idols as their lords, never ever committed shirk. Uh, and so you found that this was now a religious haven, the Kaaba, a political haven, and a commercial haven. Now, the aristocrats were thinking at the time, and, and they were thinking, well, if people come here to honor the Kaaba and honor Nabi Ibrahim alayhi salam, this is a great time for us to, um, for us to uh, make good money, no problem, but also become loan sharks. So if these guys have come from faraway journeys. The best thing to do to them is when they can't afford any more money, is charge them interest on whatever, for example, the money that they have taken. So instead of it being this religious ceremony, it becomes a commercial haven. It also becomes a commercial haven because there's many people, tourists who are traveling. Now they have a competition. There's now competitors because you've got competitors from other parts of the world who want a dominance. Rome wants a dominance, you know, Ethiopia, Yemen, you know, all these areas, they want a dominance. And now those are represented by, for example, the Christian faith. They're not happy that this Kaaba is taking all the plaudits. And so what they begin to do is to say that let's gather together our army and go and destroy the Kaaba once and for all. Say, Jabir, which surah in the Quran? Surah Al-Fil. Ahsan. Surah Al-Fil. Well done. I'm proud. I'm proud. That's fantastic. <laughs> surah Al-Fil in the Holy Quran, you find that it's a clear indicator. And it's interesting. How does the surah begin, say Jabir? What's the first ayah of the surah? بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ألم ترى كيف فعل ربك بأصحاب الفيل Have you not witnessed what your Lord done to the people of the elephant? He's talking to not just the Prophet Muhammad here. He's talking to the Quraysh. That you people have forgotten the fact that when the, that army of elephants came to try and destroy the Kaaba, we protected that Kaaba. And now... You want to come and have the audacity to attack the grandson of the man who protected that Kaaba that day? Abdul Muttalib is the one who told everybody, listen, calm down. Have trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We'll look after all of this. You know, everyone's struggling. People are praying. People are going to the mountains. And Abdul Muttalib is saying, do not worry. We will look after all of this. And now, Alam tara kayfa fa'ala rabbuka bi ashab al -feel. You imagine when this story is being told to the Arabs, it's reminding them that only a few years ago, Muhammad, peace be upon him, his family, his grandfather, was the man who was looking after that Kaaba. What have you people done with that Kaaba? And what have they done? They polluted it with their idols. Manat and Lat and Uzza and, you know, all of these idols, Hubal and so on, were all decorating that Kaaba. And it was sad because the center of monotheism established by Ibrahim alayhi salam, established by Nabi Adam alayhi salam, now becomes a center which is polluted 
with people even doing tawaf naked. Tawaf, the circumambulation of the Kaaba, in the nude. So it was really immoral, it was ignorant, and this lasted for a long time. So when the Prophet Muhammad, peace be and blessings be upon him, brought the religion of Islam, and he obviously brought Salat with him, was the Qibla still towards the Kaaba with all this idolatry going around it and this pollution, or were they praying in a different direction? Yeah, the, qibla, the Qibla was not towards the Kaaba. Um, and you know, when, when people hear that the Qibla was towards, you know, uh, Palestine and Jerusalem and so on, when they hear this, they wonder why. And, and you know, you've got this polluted place. And mind you, some of the Jewish community living at the time were actually laughing at this because it continues until the Prophet, peace be upon his family, migrates to Medina. Uh, because the verse in relation to the changing of the Qibla towards the Kaaba, as you know, we have the famous mosque, which is known as Masjid Aqsa, the Qiblatain, in relation to the two Qiblas. Okay, yes. Masjid the Qiblatain where the, the, the direction of the pilgrimage was changed, at that time, many of the Jewish community was laughing at the Prophet Muhammad, saying his religion has to use our holy sites as the places of worship. worship. But then this gets changed while he's in Medina. So how did the Prophet take back control of the Kaaba to, to bring the Qibla back to well, the Well, he Kaaba? takes back control of the Kaaba on the day of the opening of Mecca, you know. Uh, that potent combination of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi with Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam absolutely annihilates the opposition. And they're able to take back control because hither to that point, they're trying to go back and perform some sort of hajj. But they're only able to do a couple of umrahs, the minor pilgrimage in contrast to the major pilgrimage. Famous treaty of Hudaybiyah allowed them to come back, but not to come back and perform the Hajj. Remember, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, his family, performs one Hajj his whole life. And that's why there are people out there who will brag that I've been on 20 Hajj, I've been on 60 Hajj, I've been on 80 Hajj. Rasulullah went on one, and that was sufficient for him. But when he goes on that one Hajj, at this stage, the whole area is purified. But before that, they tried to go back, but the Quraysh were strong. They were stubborn. They were not allowing them to make inroads until that one and farewell pilgrimage. Inshallah. What are the steps of Hajj? We hear it's obligatory, we hear there are many different parts to it. Could you run us through the beginning? Well, it's interesting when anyone who's come with me on Hajj will tell you that I prefer to look at it spiritually than legally. I know that most people who go on Hajj are so sensitive about the legal aspects that I don't think you come back as this changed person everyone imagines. Have you ever met anyone who comes back and says... It's probably because it costs an arm and a leg. <laughs> well, like, costs an arm and a leg, I don't think is the issue in all honesty. I think, I think, I think, I think you're, you're still excited to go, but there's a lot of nerves about, for example, things such as, am I wearing my ihram properly? I just looked in the mirror, said, I remember you know, people coming up to me, I looked in the mirror, What's the penalty? I, uh, some hair fell down. What's the penalty? I'm like, you know what, just go and chill. And, and you know, people were coming up to me, but, but, but I'm like, listen, when you've come towards this journey, you've come so that your only concern is, oh, I looked in the mirror, therefore God's going to punish me. What type of God have you created in your minds? You know, when we say the Shahada, La ilaha illallah, illallah there is no God. But Allah, it's because man will make many different understandings of God. If you really think that your God is a God who's concerned about the fact that you accidentally looked in the mirror, then you've not understood the Lord. What I'm saying is that when people go to Hajj, while the legal aspect is important, don't be so pedantic on the legal aspect. Rather, look at this as a spiritual change that's going to occur in your life. A real journey for you. The steps for Hajj, first and foremost, I think what's important is before you fly, your Hajj begins. Many people assume that I'm going to begin explaining the steps of Hajj by saying, well, you know, you have to 
uh, do Umrah and then after that you do Hajj by going to Arafah and then Muzdalifah and then Mina and then this and then that. It's the typical Muslim legal pedantic outlook. First and foremost, before you go to Hajj, your journey begins then, not when you have reached Mecca. Before you go to Hajj, there are maybe some people you need to ask for forgiveness for. Don't you go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and beg Him for forgiveness when you haven't forgiven some of His creation or have not sought for forgiveness from some of His creation. I've seen people who come towards Hajj and they're begging God for forgiveness. But when their cousin begged them for forgiveness, no. And you find therefore that you get this uh, sudden surge of text messages in our community. If you notice just before yeah. Hajj, please forgive me, forgive me. And you get one after the other. And so when you're getting these messages, Alhamdulillah, that's a wonderful start. A person's recognized that, you know what, maybe there are certain things in my life which I regret. And therefore, I want to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive me, but also those who I've wronged from His creation. After that, when you're about to board your flight, you've got to remember, this is a spiritual journey. And therefore, on this spiritual journey, you're going to meet all types of characters. Hajj, if I could summarize it in one sentence, and I'm nobody too, and nor will it be worth anything, but if I could, I would say really it's, the, it's a test of your discipline. You're going to, from the beginning of that journey, you haven't even got to Medina or Mecca. From the beginning, you're going to see the person next to you who's complaining all the time. Why is the flight late? Why is the baggage this? Now that could be looked at in two ways. Either the group organizers done a... Bad job. Or... Yeah, not the best job. Or, that listen, that moment is your test. Where you're looking at yourself and your absolute origin. Because what's the whole journey? The journey is to take you back to your very self. No aftershaves, no deodorants, no gels, no best of clothing, no best of this or best of that. It's taking you back to see this is what you really are. That if you were to take all of this away, they're not coming with you to the grave. Your deeds are what's going to come with you to the grave. Because Hajj can also be a metaphor for the grave and the resurrection on the day of judgment. The whole shroud, white shroud, people gathered in one place, going from one part of land to another, struggling to find their journey. Therefore, when you're, when you're on that plane, you're still undertaking that journey. It's even recommended. Listen, take some, for example, let's say, say take some walnuts with you or take some other forms of nuts with you and give them to some of your fellow hujjaj. That is something that earns thawab. Why? Because it's a spiritual journey where a person moves from the I to the we. The human being loves to work in the world of I. I am this. I am that. Hajj is meant to take you towards the world of we. we. So that first part of the journey is very much underestimated. That many times people say Hajj is Arafah, Hajj is Muzdalifah, Hajj is Mina, Hajj is shaving, Hajj is done. Whereas a person first has to look and say, the humbling of oneself and the disciplining of oneself is the prerequisite that's required. From there, the journey should really begin in Medina. Inshallah. We'll just take a short break and come back to the rest of the questions, inshallah. Inshallah. For those of you joining us, uh, we've just been through the first part of the show on Hajj because it's the season of Hajj. And inshallah, you can join us after the break where we can take your questions live via the telephone or by sending them through in WhatsApp. The telephone number to call is plus four four two zero three five one five zero one nine nine. Inshallah, we'll see you soon after the break. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to part two of Live in London with Dr. Said Amman Akshwani. Now, tonight's topic is the topic of Hajj, seeing as it's the season of Hajj. Many of our families, friends have already undertaken the journey. 
We'd like to, just before starting the show, announce that Dr. Said Aman Akshwani will also be live from the Holy Land of Karbala as of next week for four nights, inshallah, Monday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night, and also Friday night. Another thing we could do is if you have your questions not read out on tonight's show, you could send them in and inshallah we can put them to him during next week's show from the land of Karbala. As always, you can phone in via the number on the screen, which is plus four four two zero three five one five oh one nine nine. Sayyidina, before we went on the break, you were mentioning that Hajj starts from before you step foot on a plane and it's about akhlaq and manners. And I remembered one story during the uh, break that my mm. dad used to tell me is uh, he used to say, I've never had the honor of going Hajj, so I don't know if it's actually like this, I'm just going on his word. He used to say that when you go Hajj, it's less of the spiritual, less of the prayers, but rather more fighting about who had the bigger banana, mm. who got the mm. better fruits, mm. even things such as when you get on the plane, the organizers say the front few seats are for the women and you get very large men just taking the first seat saying, no, I don't care, put the woman next to me, I'll sit next to them, etc. It's a very important thing then, the akhlaq is, is before we actually Well, I, th I think trip. the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, salam, and a number of anecdotes stress on the fact that when people mention to them, there's so many at Hajj. And you know, the country where Hajj takes place are always proud to announce their figures. Uh, so you find that when people hear, oh, this year in Hajj there's a million people, two million, people straight away assume, wow, that's something amazing. The Imams of Ahlul Bayt always stress that in reality, it, this is a scrummage. This is not a journey to God, the way some of these people are behaving on that journey. And the first place I see it, and I'm going to be very frank, the first place I see it is in Jannat al -Baqiyya. In Jannat al -Baqiyya, and some people would assume that, well, the Imam's anecdotes refer to the period of Tawaf. Tawaf will come to in a second. Listen, my face has been elbowed in Tawaf. I've been smacked in Tawaf. I've been kicked in Tawaf. And I think some people might have seen a things worse than me, especially the woman folk. Now, when you come towards Medina, in Medina, we start our journey. As, you know, it's recommended to go and visit the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family. You, as the famous tradition states, whoever visits me in my lifetime or after my death, I'll visit them on the Day of Judgment. What better honor can you have? And so you go visit the Prophet, peace be upon his family, you visit that land where the Imams of Ahlul Bayt السلام, are buried in Jannat al baqi And you're there, standing there, sending your salutations. And you've got these people ushering you away like you're a group of animals. And then all of a sudden you've got this sectarian war and debate that begins in a graveyard. Now you tell me, I want to ask you. There are non-Muslim cemeteries out there, non-Muslims. When you go in there, nobody ever assumes you've gone into that cemetery because you're going to worship that particular grave. People allow you to be in peace. There's a massive cemetery in Brooklyn, a massive cemetery in Buenos Aires. And people as assume that you as a human being require your quiet time in honoring those who have come before you. But SubhanAllah, some of the ethics that we see over there is disgusting. And it's sad that that becomes a metaphor for the rest of the trip. But you can't let it get to you as well. But when we do go, we begin our journey in Medina. And in Medina, you visit the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, his family. Can't get too near his grave because these guys will just kick you away or push you away. Um, and then after that, we'll visit Jannat al baqi And then there are certain sites which a person goes to honor. Now, you mentioned Masjid al Qiblatain, for example, uh, the place where the Qibla was changed, the, uh, the direction of prayer. We go and visit that. We go and visit, for example, uh, the grave of Hamza and the martyrs of the day of Uhud. I tried to give a lecture about the biography of Hamza with my group and I was ushered away by the people who stood by his grave. And I don't know what Islam these people follow because this is the uncle of the Prophet, peace be upon him, his family, who for some time was the master of the martyrs. So we go and visit Hamza, we go to Uhud, we visit the rest of the martyrs, uh, we go and visit some of the other mosques that are there, mosques where the Battle of Khandaq took place. Would you believe, having gone to Umrah over 15 years ago, there used to be a house for Fatima al-Zahra and a house for Imam Ali and a place for Salman, and all of these have been destroyed. 
And one of the worst things that has happened is the destruction of Muslim heritage in Mecca and Medina. I think every Muslim, irrespective if you're Shia, Sunni, whoever you belong to, someone has to speak out and stop this destruction of our heritage. Houses of the family of the Prophet, houses of the Prophet, peace be upon him, houses of the companions, houses of others have been destroyed. And they continue to be destroyed. Now, when you look at the philosophy of Hajj here, Hajj is honoring the heritage of a prophet of God called Ibrahim alayhi salam. And the laws of Hajj are then in turn given to us by the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family, when we follow his sunnah. Yet you find that the heritage of, of those sites have been destroyed. They've been taken over by five-star hotels. And I'm not one who's against development and modernity, you know. I, but there, there's a certain class to doing it. When we go to Paris, for example, I see Paris has got some wonderful modern contemporary art. But they'll remember Napoleon. They'll remember Charles de Gaulle. They'll remember the art galleries. They'll remember where their prime minister. They'll remember the greatest of, for example, palaces. There's an honoring of heritage. This is common with all human beings. Likewise in London, there's some of the most modern areas in London, contemporary art. But at the same time, there's a reverence for heritage. But it's unbelievable how when you go to Medina, and many people who have not been to Hajj, nor to Umrah, will not know what I'm saying. But when you go there, you begin to see the destruction of Muslim heritage. And I don't care if you're a Muslim or non-Muslim, this is, this is not human. This is the sign of Bedouin filth. So we go to Medina, and we're there in Medina for a certain period of time. Bump into everyone, you manage to see everyone, and then after that, you begin to make the intention to undertake the journey towards Mecca. And when you begin to undertake that journey towards Mecca, naturally, there is that act of a person wearing their ihram. Yes. And you've got many people at that period, when we go, for example, to Measure Shajara, let's say. You got many people there who will say to me, Am I wearing my ihram properly? Is my ihram on properly? Have, is my ihram fallen? And listen, all of our ihrams, in one way or the other, are a mess on that day. Um, and I always tell people, make sure you're sitting on the right angle. <laughs> now, with the ihram, instead of focusing that, Am I wearing my ihram properly? Focus on the fact that have I removed the skin of being a fox or a wolf? in the community or one of the sheep who has no opinion and am I now putting the skin of thought and intellect and reflection and contemplation the amount of people who are worried that the white piece of cloth is being worn properly instead of thinking of the spiritual cloth now that they're about to undertake is, is flabbergasted and that's something that has to change quickly. That that spiritual element, Imam Zain al-Abidin with Shibli, I recommend all the viewers what, uh, go and read that conversation between Imam Zain al-Abidin and Shibli on Hajj. Did you take off your haram? Yes, I did. So you took off the haram of disobedience and now wore the haram of obedience? Look at the difference in the mentality. And then we undertake that wonderful journey. This is to perform the Umrah. We undertake that wonderful journey going towards Mecca and telling our Lord that here we are. Now that's not something easy to say. Imam al salih used to tremble. Yeah, many times people say, Labbaik Allahumma labbaik, labbaik la sharika laka labbaik, anna alhamda wa al-ni'mata laka wa al-mulk. When people utter these lines, this is not just oscillating tongue movements. This is a person who's telling his Lord that I'm ready to face you and I don't know how many of us are ready to face the Lord. And so the Ahlul Bayt would say, do you know who you're going to face? Have you reflected? But Alhamdulillah, the leaders of the groups, the spiritual guides, many of them do a wonderful job in reciting of supplications on the way. It's a wonderful moment of the we instead of the I, that journey from Medina to Mecca. And after Umrah, I guess, comes Arafah. Mm. What's the significance of... Imam Hussain alayhi salam and Arafah, is there any connection because you have to do his ziyarat on that day? Well, 
let's make something clear. If it wasn't for Imam Hussein's sacrifice at Karbala, there would be no Hajj. No Hajj meaning understanding how to perform Hajj in the correct manner, both legally, morally, and spiritually. And the saddest of all sadnesses is that Imam al Hussein salam, is not able to perform Hajj before he is martyred on the plains of Karbala. He has to leave. And that's why I think Imam Zain al Abdin salam, in front of Yazid and Sham says, I am the son of Mecca and Mina. I'm the son of Zamzam and Safa. I'm the son of the greatest man to have held the black stone and circumambulated around the Kaaba. When Imam Zain al-Abdin says this in front of Yazid and Sham, he's making it clear that I'm the son of the man who protected this whole message with what he just did on the plains of Karbala. Secondly, Imam al-Hussein has this wonderful supplication. Mind you, Imam Zain al-Abdin's supplication on the day of Arafah, in my opinion, is equally as beautiful as his father's one. There's Dua Arafah of Imam al Hussein and there's Dua Arafah of Imam Zain al Abidin. For years, I used to recite Dua Arafah of Imam al Hussein until one day I came across Dua Arafah of Imam Zain al Abidin. It is wonderful. And that's what's so unique about Shiism. The supplications of the Ahlul Bayt, you won't find in any other school in the whole of Islam. You'll find politics in other schools, you'll find law, you'll find theology. We have political theory, we have law, we have theology. But the spirituality and the supplications of the Ahlul Bayt, you can't find that in any of the other Bedouins in other schools. Now, when you're looking at this, therefore, Imam al Hussein salam, has that wonderful dua. He recites it in the year before he's martyred, so not the Hajj before he's martyred, the Hajj before that, and it reaches us from the Ahlul Bayt. Salam. But there is no doubt that the most wonderful part of Hajj is Arafah. I'm not surprised when people say, when the traditions of the Ahlul Bayt tell us that Hajj is Arafah. Just look at this equation and you tell me whether Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God in Islam, wants to send people to hell or to heaven. Look at this equation. You've committed sins all your life. You come to Arafah. You have to stay there for a few hours between, let's say, for example, midday and sunset. When you're staying in that period, you don't have to do no supplication. Nothing's obligatory on you, just stay there. If you doubt that all of your sins have been forgiven, your hajj is void. Hold on. Me, who's disobeyed my Lord all my life, are you telling me that if I sit between midday and sunset, that's all I have to do, just sit. Nothing else, just sit there. My Lord will forgive every sin of mine and me doubting that will make my pilgrimage void. Tell me this is the Lord who wants to send people to hell or to heaven? To heaven obviously. Heaven. It's phenomenal. And that's why you see people break down in tears while they're in Arafah. Literally, they break down. Why? That realization, if explained to you properly by your spiritual guides, that realization that, hold on, I'm here, I don't need to do anything, and my Lord's just started a clean slate with me. Now mind you, don't use this as an excuse. Some viewers might think, you know what, let's just mess about for the next 25 years and then go to Arafah and chill. No, it shouldn't be used as an excuse. But those moments in Arafah, and Arafah, Ma'rifah. Not knowledge, there's a knowledge of the conscience which is rising to new depths. It's phenomenal. That in a few hours, the human being is in tune and cognizance with the greatness of their Lord and the mercy of their Lord and the forgiveness of their Lord and their Lord who keeps giving and even if we're disobedient, He keeps opening the doors for us. That ma'rifa, not ilm. I know God is one, that's ilm. Ma'rifa is when I begin to taste the beauty of having a relationship with my Creator. And so that period I recommend for anyone, you go to Hajj, just taste Arafah and you'll see how wonderful it is. It's wonderful. It's as if God's looking for excuses to forgive yes. us and yet we doubt. Well, many times, many times, if you look throughout the year, many times 
Whether it's that there's that one hour on Fridays when all your sins are forgiven, but you don't know which one. Laylatul Qadr, for example, all your sins, for example. You've got other prayers, Salatul Layl, which is uh, expiation for the sins of the day. So you've got all of these, what I call doors of mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Where he's telling you, look, here's your opportunity, make full use of it. Inshallah. Sidney, we have a caller on the line. Sure, go ahead. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. They're calling from Germany. Germany. Assalamu alaikum. Do you hear me? Yes, yes, brother, we can hear you. Uh, I'm calling you from Germany. Said I've got a question. Um, I want to ask if I scratch my head and I lose some hair, do I have to do the biha for all of it or for each hair what I lose? Okay, thank you very much, brother. He says if he scratches his No, head. no, you don't have to worry about any of that. In fact, on the contrary, is it intentional or not intentional? Yes, there is a person who's going to do something intentional. If it's not intentional, then do not worry about any kafara. And certainly do not worry about going and sacrificing a, a whole sheep simply because of that. A person who's going on hajj, if there is an intention, you know, a person intentionally is, you know, for example, looking in the mirror or that person intentionally has caused some of their hair to fall or scratched or so on, that's a different story. This person, if it's something which is unintentional, God is all forgiving. Inshallah. So we spoke about Umrah, we spoke about Arafah. Next, I guess, is Muzdalifah. What, what part of that, what, what's included in that? Well, uh, Muzdalifah is that period after you've left Arafah, where literally you see just how basic you are as a human being. You're in the middle of absolute... Madness. Madness. <laughs> there's, a, there's a photo of mine. I don't know if any of you will ever get hold of it, inshallah. It doesn't go... You have online. to bring it in and show me one week. <laughs> There's a photo of my where I'm absolutely knocked out while in Hajj. And I'm, I found a place to sleep. Now, I don't know what was underneath me. I think there's a few dead cats and, <laughs> um, and possibly someone's feces. Now, when I was sleeping there, you know, when you're that knocked out, you don't care what you're sleeping on. And subhanAllah, what was behind me? Danger, high voltage. No. I don't think there's a better description of me in any photo than, than at that moment. But Muzdalifah, you're under the plains of Muzdalifah, you know, and you're picking up pebbles. You're talking about the same areas where Tayr and Ababil destroyed Abraha. So there's, there's still that connection with, uh, with history, with what's taken place. Um, and so you're, you're collecting these pebbles because now you're going to meet that one existent who's caused you havoc your whole life. And that is, of course, the shaitan. shaitan. Um, and the symbolic representation of Satan and the way that he tried to affect Ibrahim alayhi salam when he was about to sacrifice Ishmael. So Amos Delifa were there for that period of time under the dark, you know, the dark skies. It is the most unbelievable scene and possibly the closest scene to the day of judgment. I think um, I think between Muzdalifa and Mina, between the white shrouds and the darkness of the night, that one may argue is as close as you're going to get. Yeah. So now we've talked about Umrah, Arafah, Muzdalifah, the final one you just briefly touched upon, Mina. Mm. What's included there? Well, what's included there is that um, uh, you're going to be in a tent which can have air conditioning or it might not have, depending on how good you your group the is. Deluxe package or not? Yeah, yeah, it depends if you're on the, the, the luxury packages. Uh, you know, some people have tents which may, may feel worse than your oven at home. Others have tents which are a bit more comfortable. Um, either way, one way or the other, the AC will eventually break down. You've got to get ready for that. But you're in Mina and your whole intention at this moment is that I've got to get ready because I'm going to have to uh, throw my stones, be it first on the big Satan, be it later on on all three. And well, I remember a funny story of the person who went on the group and, you know, you've collected these pebbles from Muzdalifa to go and throw them in on Satan in, in Mina and everyone's throwing the stones and there's this one person who's not throwing. So you're like, what's going on? And he's like, uh, oh, just give me a break for a bit. You're like, come on, you've got to throw the stones, you've got to throw them on Satan. He's like, give me a break. You're like, Why? He said, this guy was my friend for 30 years. You know, let me just uh, give him a chance first. And really, it's that moment where you realize that you and Shaitan have had some good nights together. You've had some bad nights together. But now you're here. And when you're throwing those stones, I remember one person, 
not too different from the caller who just called, who asked me a question where they were saying, um, uh, at what angle should I throw my pebble on Satan? Should it be at 64 degrees to the circumference of the that diameter of the proximity? Habibi, it's symbolic for Satan. Just get your pebble ready and get ready to smack it. It's too much legal pedantic moments in Hajj. What you're doing is, with those seven pebbles, let's say that you're throwing, is that you're throwing away seven of the worst sins that you have in your life. Inshallah, they don't reach seven, but let's say. D or seven of the worst attributes you have, not sins, attributes that you have in your life. Maybe you're someone who's extremely envious. Whenever you see someone uh, doing well in life, you're always envious of their success in a very negative manner. Maybe when you're throwing that stone, don't just say, Oh, I threw that stone, but it may not have hit the left, right, top corner of Satan. You're not playing football, son. What you're trying to do is you're trying to spiritually develop yourself. You're trying to throw envy out of your life. You may be someone who, for example, eats a bit too much. Yep, you go to sleep full. You wake up. You're lethargic. Maybe that part of gluttony is something you can work on. So you may be someone who, for example, um, does not encourage others to pray on the contrary, when people get on prayer, you're always, oh, what's always this prayers? You people are too religious. Throw that out of your life. The throwing of those pebbles is not just throwing at shaitan, it's throwing those areas out of your life, never wanting them to return back again. What's the symbolism between these three different areas then? Are they part of, um, for example, I heard one of them was when uh, Hazrat Ibrahim salam, took his son, Hazrat Ismail, to slaughter him because it was the will of God. Satan came to the sun and said... Yeah. So Lord. Mina is the representation of that area of the sacrifice. Okay. Yeah, so he's gone to sacrifice his son. This is the greatest moment in a life of a human being when they are willing to sacrifice their most beloved for God. It's a, it's, it's a phenomenal moment. Listen, we can't bear if our child's hurt, crying, ill, sick, not getting the best grades, not this, not that. Imagine that you're told through the dream. First time he sees the dream, he's not sure. Second time, the day of Arafah, he knows, he's certain. The, the beauty of the fact that his wife, Hajar's spirituality is unique as well. You know, sometimes in our communities, I hear many Sarahs, but I don't hear many Hajars. And Hajar's spirituality is something phenomenal. This mother is ready. And that's why I think God honored her that every Muslim has to go around her grave. It's not just God's house, the Kaaba. Next to God's house is Hajar's grave. But it's a phenomenal moment of spirituality where the mother and the father are in unison with one another. That you know what? Sacrifice the son. And when he wants to sacrifice the son, Satan naturally sees that if Ibrahim has such conviction, the followers of Abraham will all recognize that one day they all have an Ismail in their life. You know, sometimes when people ask me questions about certain things in their life, I'm like, what's your Ismail? What's your sacrifice? Nabi Ibrahim's sacrifice was his most beloved and none of us will reach that level. Maybe only the man of the 10th of Muharram could achieve what that moment was trying to achieve. But you got to ask yourself in your life, what's your sacrifice? No one likes waking up for Fajr. You agree? I'm not going to sit here and say, hey guys, I can't wait till I wake up for Fajr in nine hours time or whatever it is. But that might be my Ismail. There are some sisters, I don't blame them, they don't want to cover their hair. They could see other sisters are getting the, the plaudits, they're getting the praise. They've been told they're beautiful, they're getting attention. And you covering your hair. But that might be your Ismail. Fasting in the holy month of Ramadan, it's not easy work. That might be your Ismail. Picking up the Quran and reading one page of it a day, that might be your Ismail. Therefore, that moment Satan grasps that if I don't get in the way here, there's trouble. There's a lot of people who are going to look at this moment as a great moment. And so we honor that by the sacrifice that is made. Of course, in these days, a few members of the group go within Mina and they'll make sure that the sacrifice is done. And we hope 
that on their way, shaitan does not affect them. They go on their way and many of them do an amazing job. And all of us are waiting. And then when we get the news, of course, from then on, the last of the rights are done. Inshallah. We've had a question coming through WhatsApp, Sayyidina, from uh, Amir Sadiq from Croydon. He says, why is it wajib upon Shias to perform tawaf al-Nisa and not on the other sects? Well, the, our brothers in the Sunnah have a final tawaf. And some of our maraja have said, because there are some of our brothers from the Sunnah who became Shia. And the question was asked to some of our maraja that do they have to perform tawaf and nisa now that they've become followers of Ahlul Bayt in the sense if they've done hajj before. And you found that some of the maraja have said that the final tawaf for our brothers in Ahlul Sunnah, that could be counted as a tawaf and nisa. For us, tawaf and nisa is taken from the imams of Ahlul Bayt salam, that this was an act that was obligatory um, in their practice of hajj. Inshallah. Uh, another question that's come in, it says, what's the water of Zamzam and what is its significance? Well, it's seen as that water which has the effects of curing those who <coughs> have illnesses, for example. You found that that is the same water that gushed forth for Hajar when she went from the mountain of Safa to the mount of Marwa. You see that part of the Hajj is known as Sa'i. And that Sa'i is remembering the struggle of Hajar from these two mountains until the spring of water known as Zamzam gushed forth. Inshallah. Another question is, uh, why aren't non-Muslims allowed to enter the Kaaba or its surrounding areas? Well, the, the Muslims, for example, are not allowed to enter the Kaaba and surrounding areas if there are certain states of impurity that they're in. So before a person asks about non-Muslims, if a Muslim is in a state of Janaba, for example, um, impurity. There are certain rules for women as well upon entering Masjid al-Haram. So it's not just the case for the non-Muslim. Yes, the non-Muslim, the polytheist is spoken of, for example, in the Holy Quran. Uh, and there are laws relating to the polytheists and their entrance of Masjid al-Haram. Naturally, polytheism is seen in Islamic thought as being the greatest sin uh, possible. But you find that also Muslims in certain moments of impurity are not allowed to enter that area as well. Inshallah. Another question from Brother Irtizar from Pakistan. He says, I have the financial capacity to perform Hajj, but time is the issue. I cannot get so many days off work and I'll lose my job otherwise. What should I do and how much of an obligation on me is Hajj under such a condition? Naturally, we said that, for example, the, the, the capabilities have to be there. Financial capability has to be there, but it should not put your family in a perilous position. If therefore you know that you going to Hajj is going to cause you to be sacked and put your family in a perilous position, then no. But you should try and also look at the days that you have off and try and work around them to get an extension. There are some Hajj groups that are three weeks long. There are others that are two weeks long. And I think that most companies in the world will definitely allow two weeks leave for their employees. Inshallah. So back to the topic of Hajj. Now we've performed, let's say, the ceremony of Hajj. We've come back to our respective countries, homes, towns, etc. How do we make sure we keep that spirituality within us and not lose touch of the things we've been through, the things we've seen, the things we've experienced? And like you said, although we might take off the ihram of obedience, knowledge, etc. and replace it with jeans, t-shirts, but internally still keep that ihram on, if that makes I, sense. I think it's a fantastic question. I think the whole atmosphere of Hajj, you have to somehow try and uh, recreate on the most microcosmic level. If you were in God's house known as the Masjid, then attend your local Masjid more than you used to before. If, for example, you were willing to sit with a group of friends in Hajj and discuss religion, then start that same circle again when you're back and get those friends together and meet on a regular basis. If you saw yourself reading a lot more Quran in Mecca and Medina, then maintain that relationship with the Holy Quran. If you saw yourself, for example, serving food and serving tea and giving help to people, then likewise come back and make that small environment around you a mini Mecca again or a mini Hajj again. Every moment in Hajj is a message for our lives. All of you in that group who are sitting in the bus together or at that service station have got off and are talking 
about religion and you're discussing your affairs, start that again when you get back. I think what happens is with many people when they get back from Hajj is there is a buzz, there's no doubt. But then after that, the daily rigors of responsibility take over them. I'm not going to deny that a person can maintain that same spiritual right? There's a reason looking at the Kaaba is worship. There's a spiritual energy that's different from any other place. This is the center of the existence of the human being on the earthly level. But at the same time, try and create it or recreate it on a more minuscule level and try and maintain relations with those who not only took you to Hajj, but also were roommates. Some roommates became your best friends for life, as in barring those who snore. <laughs> oh, we've had some classics who can snore in our room, like destructive washing machine level snoring. Barring those guys, then try and keep in touch with everybody else. Are those people's hedges accepted just out of interest? Well, or? Yes, that I could find, I could find a crack in their hajj one way or the other where they messed up. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is too forgiving, is too merciful. Of course. Yeah. We have another caller on the line, Sayyidina. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam wa Assalamu alaikum. Could you share your name, uh, where you're calling Sustain from? Uh, uh, my name is Sustain Jawad. I'm calling from Hull. Okay. Uh, my question is, what were the hajj rituals performed pre-Islam? Sure. sure. Thank you very much, brother. The Hajj rituals performed pre-Islam are similar in the sense that the circumambulation of the Kaaba, the honoring of uh, Safa and Marwa, the sacrifice, all of these were performed pre-Islam. But like we mentioned, they were performed in a very immoral manner. Remember, pre-Islam, the Arab loved Ibrahim. The Arab was proud that they were from the descendants of Ismail. But they were performing these acts in a very immoral way. So the tawaf was done naked, or the sacrifice, the blood was thrown on the Kaaba. Or there was a lot of gossiping taking place around the Hajj period, and there were loan sharks everywhere who were charging an arm and a leg for people who were taking loans from them. So there was a lot of similarities, but these similarities sadly were tainted with a very immoral streak. Another question that's coming, said is what's the symbolism or purpose of shaving the man's head before he comes back from Hajj? You know, it's, it's, it's this new start for the human being, isn't it? So it's like you're almost yeah, you're, reborn you're again. you're completely ridding yourself of what is your prized possession, you know, as a human being, your beauty, and you're taking yourself back to the minimum that you can. So here, this is another of that moments where you're not just shedding the physical, but you're shedding that attachment that you have to all that you perceive as glorious, but which may not necessarily help you when you're in the grave. Okay. We have uh, another caller on the line, Sayyidina. Sure. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Could you give us your name, where Salam. you're calling from? Yeah, my name is Nizi. I'm calling from Southwark. Okay. Yes, what's your question, brother? Uh, why are why are the Hajj rituals the enactment of Prophet Ibrahim's family? Could you just repeat that question, sorry? Why are the Hajj rituals the enactment of the Prophet Ibrahim's family? Okay, thank you. Are, are the Hajj rituals reenactments of Prophet Ibrahim's family? Things that he did? Or yes, yes, all the Hajj rituals are related to Nabi Ibrahim alayhi salam, but are guided to, uh, guided by the acts of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and his family. So Nabi Ibrahim salam, did not exactly explain to us the wearing of the ihram cloth. Yes. Nabi Ibrahim salam, does not exactly explain to us what's prohibited in the period of Hajj. So to say that the whole of Hajj is related to Nabi Ibrahim salam, is not right. Yes, where Nabi Ibrahim and the sacrifice took place, where Sarah and where Hajar and Ismail lived, that is definitely part of the Hajj. But the laws of Hajj have come to us from the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and his family. Peace be upon him. Uh, a question from Sister Shahila from New York is, if uh, a salah is considered qaza, if it was started shortly before the time for it should become qaza, then the time comes for the salah is passed. 
having the niyyah for a non qaza salah. We'll be discussing that in our next show, inshallah, where we'll look at the act of worship that is salah. From the Karbala, inshallah, inshallah from next week. Uh, thank you for tuning in to our episode today and thank you to our esteemed guest, Dr. Sayyid Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if you'd like to follow the doctor, he'll be live from our studios in the Holy Land of Karbala from next week, inshallah. He will be going live Monday night. Wednesday night, Thursday night, and Friday night, and he has already promised the topic of salat, inshallah. Yes, there's a number of the topics, inshallah, we'll be discussing. Nights that they'll be discussing. Inshallah. As always, you can send in your questions via WhatsApp, or you could ring in the number direct. We look forward to seeing you again soon, inshallah. and also the viewers at home. Please don't forget us in your prayers. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.